The things we talked about spectrum meltdown and they rely on some of the more advanced ways that the CPU operates. It's probably worth diving down and actually looking at how a CPU actually executes the code we write. I mean, we've touched on this before. We did a video on pipelining. We did a video on caching, but we'll sort of delve down and see what happens below the surface when we actually get our CPU to execute our code. Let's start by having a simple example line of code that we might want to look at what happens. Let's take a line of code that takes a variable. Let's take a line of code that's going to add up a plus b plus c plus d times e. So I've written this in a sort of C-like language. And so we're going to do this calculation. Now, as I'm sure most of us are aware, when we take that and put it into our C compiler and run it, it gets converted into the machine code that the CPU executes. So we'd take that line of code and then we'd have to convert that into the machine code, and then the CPU executes that machine code. So a program like this would end up looking, and I'm going to use ARM assembly here just because I know it better than any, anything else. Perhaps for the first instruction, we would load the value from memory of A into a register. So let's pick R0. We've got 14 or so of them we can use. There's 16 of them, but some of them get used for different things that we don't really use. So we load the value of A into R0. Next thing we want to do is we want to add that to the value of B. We're going to have to make sure we get the operator precedence right. So we can load the value of B into a register. So let's load in the value of C here into another register. And we might as well do D and E as well. So load R3, comma D, and we'll load R4 with E as well. And now we can start adding these things up, multiplying them to produce the actual result we want. Now we've got to make sure we get the precedence right, but we could either start by adding A and B together, then add on C, and then multiply D and E and add them together, or we could do that one first. I'm just going to start going from left to right. As long as the maths is right, we'll get the right result. So we'll add together A and B. Now we've put those two values in R0 and R1, and we need to store the results somewhere. We are going to need the value of A again after this, so we'll reuse the register R0. So we're saying put into R0 the value of R0, plus R1. So this is adding together, storing the result in R0. So we've now added A and B together. We want to add on C. And so we can do the same thing. Add to R0, the value in R0, which is now, because of this instruction, A plus B. We want to add on the value in R2. This has now got A plus B plus C in R0. Now we need to do the multiplication, and we need to do that separately before we add it on so we get the right result. So we'll multiply. And we'll see we've got an ARM2 chip here, so we've got the multiply instruction there. And we need to put the results somewhere. Let's use R5. D, which we put in R3. And E, which we put in R4. And then we want to add the result of that onto the value in R0. And now R0 contains the result of A plus B plus C plus D times E. And we could then store that back into X. So that line of code there, that one line of C code, would become what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 different lines of assembler. And I've numbered them because we're going to refer to them at different times. So we can say instruction 1, instruction 5, etc., to refer to the different ones. Now, we might expect that our CPU will just execute instruction 1, then instruction 2, instruction 3, instruction 4, instruction 5, and so on, in order to generate the result. And some CPUs do, in fact, work exactly like that. But actually, if you think about what these CPUs and what these instructions are actually doing, you might think, well, actually, when I get this first one, I've got to go and access memory. And as we talked about in the caching video many years ago, cache is perhaps a, an old fashioned English word, but it basically just means a small place where we can store things. So you might use it to store your hidden treasure if you're a pirate or to store your food for winter. On a modern CPU, you probably say around 200 nanoseconds to actually go and get the value out of your main memory and load it into the register. Now, of course, if these are already cached in the same bit of memory, then you may find that these all execute very quickly. We don't know that. But this isn't the only way we could write this program, because if we take this instruction here, instruction 6, where we do the add of R0 and R1 to add up A and B, well, we've got those two values here. They're already in the registers at this point in the program. So there's nothing to stop us moving this instruction up there and it would still have exactly the same effect. So instruction six could be moved to be between instructions two and three, and then we'd do the next instruction, which was the same as instruction three here, which would be LDR R2, comma, the values in memory that's representing the letter, the variable C. Have exactly the same effect. We just moved that 
instruction earlier. So you could rewrite this program in various different ways. Now, why is that interesting? Well, when we think about how a CPU is designed, in that you will have various different, what would perhaps be termed execution units within there. Now, one of them is what's generally referred to as the ALU, or the arithmetic and logic unit. And that's the bit of your CPU that does addition, it does subtraction, it does sort of logical operators and or and so on. But you also have other bits inside there, and one of the bits you'll often have in a modern CPU is a part of your CPU that handles loading and storing values from memory. Sometimes they interact, sometimes they don't. Now, assuming that they, they are separate parts of the CPU, if we look back at our instructions here, we execute instruction one, it uses a load store unit to get a value for memory. We execute instruction two, it uses the load store unit to get a value for memory. Instruction three, it uses a load store unit to get a value for memory. Four, uses the load store unit to get a value for memory. Five, uses the load store unit to get a value for memory. Six, changes and uses the ALU, as do seven, eight, and nine, before instruction 10 uses the load store unit. So we've got a pretty sequential series. The first five instructions all execute using the load store part of the CPU. The next four instructions execute using the ALU. And the final instruction again uses the load store unit. But as we said, we can reorder that into this version here using instructions W, X, Y, and Z to differentiate them. And we execute the first instruction, instruction W, uses the load store unit. Instruction X uses the load store unit. Instruction Y uses the ALU. Instruction Z uses the load store unit. OK, what difference does that make? Well, let's think about what's happening. When we're using the load store unit, the ALU isn't being used. That part of the CPU is just sitting there not being used. And when we're using the ALU, the load store unit's sitting there not being used. That's what we saw there. But does that have to be the case? Could we actually design it? And you probably guess the answer is that yes, we can. So that while the load store unit, say, is being used, that we can run instructions on the ALU part as well. I'm going to turn the paper around and I'm going to draw this as a sort of timeline. So these are our two units, and we've got time running along this side as well. I'm using the computer file paper in a radically different orientation, but never mind. So we're going to execute the instructions on here. And the first thing that happens is that we execute instruction W. No problem, that's going to take a certain amount of time to execute. That's using the load store unit to execute it. These are being fetched in and decoded and sort of executed by the different execution units. We then execute the next instruction, which is X. And we couldn't execute this any earlier because the load store unit was being used to execute that one. So no difference than what we had before. We're using this one after the other. We now come to execute the add instruction. Now we can't execute this any earlier than this point in time because this depends on the value of registers R0 and R1, which aren't set until this point. So we need those two values so we can start doing instruction Y here. Now, actually, it's an add. It's not going to take as long as fetching things from memory because it's all inside the CPU, so we can use a smaller box. And we can put instruction Y there. And this depends on the value being fetched from there. And I'm just going to show this as an arrow here. But the next instruction, load R2, comma C, well, that doesn't depend on anything except the value in memory. And our load store unit is not being used. So if we build our CPU right, there's nothing to start that instruction being executed at the same time. And that means that actually, when we come to the next instruction, which would be, well, which, which would be the best instruction to execute next in this example? Let's go back to our program. We've executed instructions one, two, six, and three already. That's W, X, Y, and Z, we've rewritten them as. So let's put instruction seven here, what was instruction seven. And this is now going to become, I'm going to have to do this, it's going to become instruction A. I'll hopefully remember to say instruction A, but you can guess the context. So I'm referring to A on its own, it's probably the variable. If not, it's probably the instruction. So we can now execute instruction A. And again, instruction A depends on two things. It depends on the value of R0, which is going to come from this instruction. So we have to have that ready. But it also depends on the value of R2, which is coming from this instruction. So we have to have that ready as well. So it can't actually happen any point before this point in time. So this would be the LDR 
R2, comma, dot, dot, dot. And this is the add R0, and this is the next add. But again, we can start to interleave more with instructions. We can say, OK, well, let's put instruction 4 here at the same time. We'll call this instruction B and so on. If we put that at that point, we can execute instruction B at the same time as we do A. And I'm really confusing myself with pens here. And so again, we've saved some time because rather than having to execute that in the same thing, we can do these two things at the same time. Now, to be able to do this, we need these instructions need to execute on different execution units. We couldn't, for example, execute two add instructions at the same time because we haven't got two ALUs. Although there's no reason why you couldn't build a CPU with two ALUs. And if you look at modern CPU designs from Intel, AMD, ARM, etc., they all ha often have multiple ALUs to allow you to do just that. Um, but because of the different types of instructions, we can execute them at the same time. And the reason we can do that is because they don't depend on the result of one to work out the other. So they're working on different things and they're using different parts of the CPU. And a CPU that enables you to do this is what's known as a superscalar CPU because it can run multiple instructions at the same time. We could continue doing this and we'd end up, we execute instruction B, then we've got to execute instruction C. Instruction D uses a multiply and actually on a CPU you've probably got a separate execution unit which does multiplies because you can actually do them faster that way. So you have a multiply unit as well. So we can execute that multiply D up there. We think, well, okay, can we do the add at the same time? Well, no, because we need the result of that as well. So we can then execute the add down here before finally, and it just fits on the paper like that. So we can actually squash things up and we're going to save some time because if you think about it, we have the original order of the program and here's one I made earlier, right, or as in I'm just about to draw and Sean will do some very clever cutting. <laughs> so even if we had a superscalar processor, we've only got one load store unit, we've only got one ALU, we've only got one multiply unit, we wouldn't have any opportunities with this program to run two instructions at the same time. So this version of the program would still take 10 instructions. This one still takes 10 instructions. But with a superscalar processor, we have the opportunity to sort of execute two instructions at the same time because they use different bits of the CPU. Now you need to design the CPU to allow that, but that enables us to speed things up a little bit because while this is waiting to get the value from memory, we can execute some more instructions. Now, that's all very well, and superscalar processors started to appear in the late mid 90s, things like the 68060, the Pentium, I think, was superscalar. But they require the code to be written in a way that enables this to happen. So this program wouldn't have been able to do anything. This one would. But as we said when we were developing this, we could work out which instructions we could move around to get that speed up based on what those instructions depended on. So this instruction we said, what was 6 became y, only depended on the values of r0 and r1, which had been set by instructions 1 and 2. So we could move that earlier without affecting anything in our program because it only depended on those two values. So we could either do this in the compiler, or well, by hand if you're writing the assembly yourself like we just did here, or it's possible to let the CPU work it out. And so what a modern CPU does, what's called an out-of-order CPU is reorders the instructions without supposedly breaking the rules of what each instruction does. So it will still execute it as if it was written like this and it won't change, break any of the rules of that. But it will say, well, hang on, it will spot that this instruction could happen earlier and so move it earlier to gain some of that parallelism by the fact and execute them together at the same time. And that works generally very well, but as we saw with things like Spectre and Meltdown, if you allow things to happen too far earlier and start doing what's called speculative evaluation, where you say, OK, I've got the stuff I need to execute it now. I don't know if I need the result, but I might do, so I'll execute it anyway. And then if I need it, I've already done it. And if I don't need it, well, I'm still waiting for this to come in anyway, so it doesn't matter that I've done it, I've not lost any time. Well, then it's turned out that you can have sort of side channels where you can sort of see that that's happened or not, which has caused a few issues with computing. It goes along here like this, intersects the curve somewhere else, flips over and it's over here. So this is 4G. Now, 
we won't look at it anymore. Right? The actual formula for this is just the mathematics to do with lines and the tangent of this curve. It's actually not very complicated. The point is that what we're doing is by multiplying g,